I'm tired of your B girls, yeah, that's your name. And, and if, if you, you don't, don't know what B means, let us explain. Yo, what's up? I'm P.O.D. And I'm Mr. Charlie. And we are the Young and Restless. Yes, sir. And we're on Fascination Podcast, bringing our smash shit to you once again, my friend. B stands for Broncos, Benz, BMW, Bass, Bangles, and the Pair Balls. I believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Welcome back, Streetwalkers. This episode is a blast from the past. I got Mr. Charlie and P.O.D. from Young and Restless, that hip-hop band from the 90s. Both of these dudes are super cool. They're still doing stuff. They got new music coming out. They got songs and films, and they got documentaries in the works, and there's a book coming out. These dudes are amazing. It's Charles Trahan and Lenurse Johnson. Mr. Charlie, P.O.D., these dudes are amazing. They let me play their biggest hit, B-Girls. This one I dedicate to you, Stephanie. That's my sister. Plus, I get to play their new track, Country Boys, by Young and Restless. Oh, man, I'm so excited. These dudes were so cool. Hopefully, they'll come back on sometime in the future. These dudes were super, super dope. I really appreciate all of their time. They were the friendliest guys, and they made this happen. So thank you so much, Charles. Thank you so much, Lenurse. And this is my conversation with Mr. Charlie and P.O.D. from Young and Restless. Welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, Mr. Charlie and P.O.D. from Young and Restless. What's up, dudes? Cooler, cooler, cooler. What's happening? Taking it one day at a time. Oh, check. Oh, I see what you did there. I said Young and Restless. You say one day at a time. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. All right. <laughs> I understand that both of you guys are from Miami, right? Yeah. Correct. How did y'all meet? High school. That's high school, right, guys? Yeah, high school. Look. I wanted to be a lot of things when I was in high school, probably even a rapper. That's <laughs> a lot of white rappers. Yeah, well, there's three now. So, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, what made you guys want to become musicians? Like, why rap? Why hip hop? I try to keep it real quick. But um, since I was a, a kid, I was fascinated with hip hop. I'm from the graffiti level of you know, New York watching what they did and um, listening when the rap first came on the scene. It was it was real hip. You know what I'm saying? It was just something that um, I, I gravitated to. And I started with the break dancing and the DJing. And then I went into the rapping. That led me into doing talent shows in the high school. And one of my friends had a dance group with Lenars, P.O.D. He was dancing first and rap. Well, not, I can't say first. He was doing both. I to hear him rap and I, you know, introduce myself and we just kind of clicked since then. And, um, you know, that's that's what made me want to get into it. What about you, P.O.D.? What made you want to get into hip hop? I actually started playing drums and singing at a young age. I don't know. Rap kind of like came in with the whole Planet Rock situation and everything like that. So then the whole dancing movement thing came. What really made me get into rapping was like I got into this talent show and I was singing. But it's like we had a tie between me and it was actually my brother's dance group. It was called the Throw the Deep Boys. And we actually I got into a tie. And so the only way for me to break the tie was either sing another great song or do something that nobody hadn't done. And so I wrote my first rap. I remember I had practiced it for like a whole week. And I knew if I tied with them, this is what I was going to do. And so when I rapped it, the crowd went crazy. And I was like, okay, this, I want to rap. Then I don't want to sing no more. I, wanna, I just want to rap. So that's why I went with it. So that rap, was it an original rap? Was it original lyrics? Yeah, it was an original rap. Yeah. So how old were you at that time? I was like 14 then. So you started writing your own lyrics at 14? Yeah. And then you never stopped? No. What about you, Mr. Charlie? Do you write lyrics? I stopped writing the last probably 10 years. I just started getting in front of the mic and freestyling my lyrics and going back and fixing it up. Um, I used to write, you know, a lot when I was younger, but uh, somewhere in 2000, I stopped writing. I just uh, freelance it and then go back and fix it up. 
That makes sense. Okay, so you guys find each other in high school, and y'all are like, hey, you want to do this? Yeah, let's do this. Now, I can't imagine that there's a, I mean, especially back then, I don't think there was a whole lot of people with their doors open saying, hey, I'll sign you. Come be hip hop artists. Like, how did you guys find a label and get signed and then, you know, off to the races? But how did it all first start? Well, for me, I had did my first like rap audition for a label with uh, Meriwether Records. And then I did another one with Foresight. And I remember this lady named Janice. I tell people this story all the time. We have a mutual friend by the name of Alex. And his mom was working for a record company. I forget the name of which one she was working for, but she brought us over to her house to audition for the guy that was running the label. I almost want to say it was Meriwether Records. That was me and you? Yeah, that was me and you. That wasn't Meriwether Records. It was it was another company. I know what you're talking about. That wasn't Meriwether. Yeah, and she was like, I think y'all would be better as a group instead of like being independent solo artists. Y'all should come together and be one rap group. And so we thought, we were like, okay, well, we'll get out of shot. And before you know it, Charles ended up calling me up. So it was quite some time later, but Charles ended up calling me up and finding me in all actuality. He found me all the way in Hollywood. I don't know how they got that. Hollywood? Yeah, because I, I was at my cousin's house visiting my cousin them for the weekend. I, I, and him and P-Man Sam were had been looking for me, but back then it wasn't, well, I mean, they had, Sam had a cell phone, but I didn't have no cell phone. Beeper, I ain't had no beeper, no nothing. That's why I don't know how they got my cousin's address, but they ended up finding me. And well, 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 let, well, let me go back a little bit. Yeah. So what happened was we used to go to this, you know, parades and talent shows. We used to to always do this in in school and everything. So we had to start rapping against a lot of people. So P-Man Sam, who's who's rest in peace, he he died a few years ago. I used to work at Sam Car Wash all the time with my cousin. And so I used to always rap to Sam there because he had a car wash. So I made my cousin, my older cousin, who used to be in the streets with Sam, say, you know, make a, make a rap about his car wash. And then he'll probably put you on the radio. And uh, so I made a rap about the car wash, you know, and he liked it and everything. He was like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do something with you. I'm going to record you. And that just like went to pass. So a couple of years later, we had a parade, me and ours. He had a record store. So when we walked in, he was, he remembered me rapping and say, y'all battle these dudes. If y'all win, I'll give y'all a record deal, you know? So we beat the boys in the rap contest. Still, we kind of like didn't hear nothing from Sam for a couple of months. But one day my friend, which was Sam's little brother, because everybody kind of like family connected. You know, I used to work at the car wash. So he came to my house one day and knocked on the window. He said, hey, Sam, ready to put y'all in the studio and, you know, we'll put you in the studio because he really knew me more than he knew Nars, even though Nars had came up to the record store. And so I'm like, you for real? He's like, yeah. So I said, man, you lying. You know, you bull. You Can you curse? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I was like, man, you bullshit, man. So when I got up, you know, back then to see a jag in your yard was like the president. You know what I'm saying? So when I seen Sam Jag. A what? A Jaguar. The car. Yeah. Oh, okay. When yeah. I looked outside, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, oh, this shit real. You know what I'm saying? So I put on my clothes and, you know, he was like, yeah, I'm ready to do it. Da, da, da. You know, because I think he had done got shot right before then. Right. He had got shot up and he said he wanted to invest in his money. I guess he was feeling like I need to do something <laughs> with my life. He says, do you want to find a boy who you was rapping with? In the, uh, you want to rap with him? I was like, yeah, because I knew Nars had a lot of skills. He was just so lyrical. And he had this one song that I really liked it called B-Girls. I knew it'd be better if I collaborate with Nars doing whatever we was finna do. So uh, we went looking for Nars, couldn't find him nowhere, (laughs) nowhere. So the only last stop I knew was his cousin that stayed in Hollywood. Hollywood, Florida? Yeah. Not not Hollywood, California, but the Hollywood in Miami. All right. I knew that's probably what you thought. Hollywood, they went way to Hollywood, California? (laughs) So um, we, we went to Hollywood. We finally found him. We went to the studio. Um, we, I think he took us right to the studio that day. We met Eric Griffin, right? Yeah. Rest in peace, Eric Griffin. He was the producer that made the Poison Ivy and the B-Girls. Since then, man, everything kind of just fell in place. It was I, I could say it was kind of like a domino effect. Everything just happened so quick that we we had to really catch up and, and get ready for hit records and this and that, you know, videos and because it just hit off real hard. Now, it hit pretty hard and pretty fast. What was it like for you guys? I mean, it was almost like one day you're not famous and the next day you are. Exactly. Exactly. How did you guys handle that kind of all of a sudden fame? P.O.D., you go first. Really, it happened so fast to where the transition I would say was more or less something we had to grow into because we were still kids. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, 
it was real, but for us, it was more surreal than anything. It was like, I can't believe it. Oh, no, 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 no. You know what I'm saying? It was more fun and games for us. Like, I took it serious, but I couldn't really take it serious because, like, I was like, we were still kids. Like, we had, we were, we are still young at heart right now. Like, me and Charles are idiots. You feel like we are, like, when you get around us, it's, if you don't have a laughing bone in your body, then that's the only way you're not going to laugh around us. And so, more or less, the music was fun. It was funny. We were too insane kids with other insane kids around us. So the professionalism of it and all that kind of stuff right there, that kind of came with time. But for the most part, that shit was just like, just fun for us. Like, we were still in high school. So, you know, like to be traveling across the country and doing shows and meeting all these other big time celebrities that people only see on your TV raps and shit like that. That part of it was more surreal. But then the competition part of it, like I used to battle all of the artists. You know what I'm saying? Like, so that part of it was more still like fun, but I, I don't, that shit was so instantaneously, it don't make no sense. It was really like overnight success, overnight. Right. It's like you, you come in, you, you becoming a celebrity instantly and you got to grab it because you got women, you got people seeing your videos, your family members calling you. I said, I heard you on the radio. I heard you on the radio. They going just <laughs> as crazy as we are. We hearing our song on the radio for the first time. So you can imagine that just, you know, it, it's just a, the best feeling in the world to be torn with public enemy. And, and we, we knew Tupac before he was Tupac when he was with Digital Underground. So we meet him on the, the tour with Digital Underground, Public Enemy, Kwame, all these big artists that we was just wow. seeing just yesterday on Yo! MTV Raps and BET and the video mix. And man, it's like, it was crazy, man. And then they hanging with us. It's one thing to be doing shows with them, but to actually have them wanting to hang around you was, was totally unbelievable. You know? I can't even imagine. Now, at this time, like when... That album, uh, something to get you hyped. That came out in like 1990. So you guys were like 17, 18 years old, something like that. Right, right, right. What was the biggest? What was the scariest part? I mean, you guys are just a couple of kids, and then all of a sudden you're pulled into this huge, huge orbit of, like you said, all these big famous artists, all the MTV and the touring. What was the scariest part? I'm gonna say the scariest part for me was realizing that. The person that you trust in your life with is ripping you off, you know, and now you got to grow up and get attorneys and, and, you know, and be a man now. And it got kind of serious to the point where, you know, we, we kids, but we ready to go to war with the executive producers, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) So it was, it was, it had some frightening moments. And also just not just with that, we had a lot of shows where Norris he got a mouth on him. <laughs> what? No way. So a battle rapper has a mouth on him. Get out yeah, of here. He has a mouth. Like, you know, it, I, I, it's, it, he, he means well. He means well, but <laughs> this shit don't come off like that. Because well, my point is, we had a show one time and they let these fans uh, drive on with their cars. So they're driving on to this, like a plant. What was yeah. it, like a field? It was, it was like a. It was a ranch. A ranch. A ranch. That's the best way to put it. And People had guns. They had they they were able to bring their you know artillery on, and so we performing, and they kept fighting and and all this kind of stuff. So Nars got so tired, I had to stop the show. He said, "If y'all fight one more time, y'all gonna waste y'all money because we gonna leave this motherfucker." And I said, "It's one more fight." And so we, we start back rapping again and somebody right in the front start fighting. He say, that's it. The show fucking <laughs> over. Drop the mic. And somebody yelled in the crowd, you got me fucked up. Bah, 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 bah. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so my brother never, my brother was begging me to come on tour with us and do some shows. But it was his first show. And my brother ain't want to come back no more because he had to run and jump off stage. And, you know, it was just, <laughs> but we had a lot of crazy incidents like that too. That was frightening, you know. Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. Holy shit. So listeners, this was back in the, the early 90s when all that shit that you guys saw in Boys in the Hood, all that was what was happening back then. So you're telling me that this was all, that wasn't just on TV and in the movies. No. Like, uh, holy shit. Oh no, this shit was real. You got to think, in 1991, we made fun music, but in 1991, I actually got in a shootout and I got shot up, you know, in my back mm-hmm. arm. So we was going through a lot of things that gangster rappers was talking about in the streets. We just really didn't do that kind of music. 
Hey, Streetwalkers, here's a word from our sponsors. So I ran into previous guest of this show, Chris Gronkowski, the other day, and it went a little something like this. Hey, Steve. Hey, Chris. Hey, you know what sucks? When I get done with my workout at the gym, my protein shake's not cold anymore, man. It's room temperature. <laughs> Weird. I haven't run into you at the gym lately. Busted. Okay, truth be told, I don't work out. But I do get thirsty after a long day of podcasting. I just can't seem to keep my cocktails cold. You should use an ice shaker. What's an ice shaker? The ice shaker is a double wall, vacuum insulated, stainless steel shaker bottle with a patented twist and agitator that breaks up the protein powders. So you're saying I should switch to an ice shaker, take out the agitator so I can fit more ice in the cup and it'll stay cold longer? Steve, you don't need more ice. The ice shaker is third party tested and verified to keep your drink cold for 30 plus hours. Chris, you're a genius. I'll still remove the patented screw and agitator and just add more booze. I guess technically you could, but if you actually use the ice shaker as a protein drink cup, the agitator breaks up the powder and doesn't bounce around like you're shaking a paint can. Why are we still talking? Let's party. Gronk style! That's right, Streetwalkers. Ice Shaker is the new sponsor at Fascination Street Podcast. Ice Shaker is made from kitchen-grade stainless steel so it doesn't smell all funky after you use it a couple of times like those cheap plastic ones. When I'm out and about doing interviews or partying Gronk style, I use the Fascination Street Podcast Edition 26-ounce Flex Ice Shaker Cup and it keeps my drink cold until the sun comes up. You saw Ice Shaker on Shark Tank. All five sharks made an offer with Mark Cuban and Alex Rodriguez closing the deal. Now you can get a deal too. Order your own 26 ounce flex cup right now at iceshaker.com and use the promo code FSP for $5 off your first order. Once again, that's iceshaker.com, promo code FSP, as in Fascination Street Pod, for $5 off your first order. That's iceshaker.com, promo code FSP. Let's get back into it. So how did you guys get involved in that part? I mean, you guys are just doing fun. It's not like you're calling anybody names in your raps or anything. Oh, okay. It's, it's our personal life, you know? Yeah, 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 I got that one right there. What it really was is, I would say, we didn't rap about our lives. Like, things that's going on right now that people rap about, like, they, they go, we didn't do that. No, we was living, we was trying to really like hide that shit. We was trying to get away from that. We didn't want what, the way we were really living. So our music came across as more or less the fantasy fairy tales, you know, like Louis Vuitton, the B-Girls, give me them guts. <laughs> yeah, we, we was laughing. We were, we were really rapping about the life that we wanted. You know what I'm saying? More or less. That wasn't the way we were living. You know what I'm saying? So like the Tim getting shot, Man, shit, the shootout out the shootout. You know, man, that's and, and also we 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 can say this now. Sorry to cut you off, but we can say this now. We also had situations where we got gypped out of money, so we wasn't making money. So it led us to get into street activities. You know, <laughs> a lot of stuff that well we had to try to survive by any means necessary too. And, and then the truth of the matter, like when you really just break it all the way down, the truth of the matter is everything and everyone around us was associated with the streets and gangster thug life. That's really what it is. Our CEO was one of the biggest and notorious drug dealers out of Miami, Florida. Our road managers were his little brother and, and his sister. They used to, listen, you got two 16-year-olds and two 17-year-olds in a van all over the country, and the oldest people in the van with us are 20. You know what I'm saying? And they're driving us everywhere in the world, like, like, and they gangsters. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like, for real. For, <laughs> they're 20 years old, they got guns. They, like, we all, like, this was the life. You know what I'm saying? So if the bullshit happened, we had people around us that were ready to handle that shit, but we were more or less on all of that shit, too. This music really, I think music really saved my life. You feel me? Like, man shit, man shit. Yeah, it really saved my life. So we were really living that type of life for real, for real. The stuff that, like, N.W.N. all was talking about, we was living that shit for real. And also back back to your first question too. Along all of that Ice Cube going through that stuff with the NWA, we was torn with them in the midst of all of the Suge Knight and yeah. things that they was going through with Ice Cube, and we was on tour with them through all of this. You know, just the night, this is when it was at. We was on tour with them. Yeah, when he first split up with NWA and everything. Right. Jesus. Yeah. 
and then they were beefing or whatever. Man, what do you think you guys would be doing if y'all had never gotten into music? Honestly, the, the, and not just to be over exaggerating, we'd probably be dead or in jail. Thank you. That right there is the motherfucking thing. That's the way to sum it up in, in, a, in a nutshell. <laughs> dead or in jail. Now you know he agreed with you if he stood up for that one. <laughs> straight up. Just being, just keeping it in a nutshell, that's what it is. Yeah, straight up. We'll be dead. I, 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 I'm, I'm telling you, I would be. I would be dead. Because of that mouth. Because somebody would have to do it to me. Because I, mean, I was, man, that shit was real. It was really real out here. Yeah. All right. So we talked a little bit about B-Girls. Okay, look, B-Girls, I'm from San Antonio, born and raised. I'm, I'm just a couple of years younger than you guys, and my sister is exactly your age. Now, this was in 1990, and even like two weeks ago, before I reached out to Mr. Charlie, two weeks ago, I was telling my wife about this song, B-Girls, and she had never heard it. Oh, by the way, uh, it's all, you can only listen to it through uh, Alexa if you do that weird thing where you pay a whole lot of extra money for Alexa or whatever. So I did not do that. I went to YouTube and I played it from there. And then just out of curiosity, I just texted my sister and I said, Hey, what does B stand for? We hadn't talked about this song in forever. And instantly she hit me back and said, I'm glad you asked. B stands for Broncos, <laughs> Benz, Bean, W, Bay, Spangles, and Pair of Bars. And I could not stop laughing. That song, you know, it's a part of my sister and my relationship just because, you know, of the time period that it was and how hilarious that song is. I mean, that song is ridiculous. Right, right. right. And I'm guessing that basically a B girl is a gold digger, right? That's what the girls are into. It's yeah, all right, this expensive right, right. shit. Right. Yeah, pretty much. Did you say, Mr. Charlie, that you had heard that song before and that was one of the reasons that drew you to POD? Exactly. His creative skills back then was just, he was a, ahead of his time. You know, a lot of people say like, cause we both had that kind of mindset, but I would say Nars just had that. His brain was just on some other stuff, like the way he thought about stuff. Now, the funny thing, when we got to the studio, um, the song actually, the way Nars wrote it, it was actually faster. He'd be like, B stands for Broncos, but W, B, B, goes in the pair of bars. When you see us, put down the avenue. So the producer, Eric Griffin, uh, he was like, slow it down, slow it down. So we was like, no, it's going to mess, mess up the song, you know. But and see, we had to learn about the music industry for us on the production and that these producers, why they was producing. Right. They had something to give to the game to that we had to learn. So we thought that he was kind of like messing us up because even with Poison Ivy, we was rappers. So, so he told us to sing the lyrics to Poison Ivy. I know a girl named Trudy. When you think about it, that's not rap. Right. So we totally was against that. But once we did it and it blew up and we slowed B girls down, we thought people wasn't going to love it. But he was doing it in a way where everybody can say it without having any trouble right. with the, you know, the speed that NARS originally had it at. So and it worked out perfectly. It's a lot more fun if you can sing along. Exactly. Right. I can't do that with with rap nowadays. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck they're saying. I, I don't, I just don't get Twister, it. Some Twister of that, probably the only person could get away with that. Twister. A lot of the rap nowadays, A, I can't tell what they're saying and B, sometimes they're, they're just saying words that rhyme. Anything, they don't yeah, even like, yeah. it's, they're not telling the story or, or, or expressing right. a thought. P.O.D., tell me why you wrote B-Girls. When we go on lunch break at Kara City City Hat, we would like go to different restaurants, we go to Popeye's, go to get in our cars, go to McDonald's or whatever else. But for the most part, all the ice cream trucks would park in front of the school down the street. And we would walk down there. So it was a couple of days I kept trying to talk to girls, you know what I'm saying? And they just, you know, at that time, Cadillacs, the bars and the bowls was on them. The baby Broncos had came out, you know what I'm saying? So it was a big car fashion show. A car show was going on at lunch break. And all the girls was into that. So I was walking with one of my old boys named Steve Bass. I'll never forget. He was like, man, dog. I hate these old, these old B girls. And I was like, what's a B girl? He's like, you gotta have a Bronco, you gotta have a Benz. And I bust out laughing. I said, I'm gonna write that. <laughs> I'm gonna turn that into a record. And he was like, no, you can't do it. I was like, okay, watch me. By the time we left lunch break, went home from school, the next day I came back and I had the whole record wrote. And I rapped it to him and he was like, bro, that shit was like phenomenally crazy. So I started just like performing it inside the hallways you know what I'm saying? At the school or whatever, I'd just be singing and singing it then. I guess Charles had to hurt me doing it one day. And so that was like one of the first records I put out. And the crazy part, remember I was saying 
earlier during this interview, I said me and Charles, two of the most comical idiots you ever want to meet in your life. Why I said that was because even at the end of B-Girls, when we come in and we say like, Cadillac bro, Cadillac bro, Cadillac bro, Cadillac bro, Cadillac bro. None of that was supposed to be in a record. <laughs> the record was supposed to be over. You know what I'm saying? And so when we started saying, balls on the Cadillac, bro, and then Charles came there, meow, meow. <laughs> stupid. So we're looking at the corner of our eyes at our producer and CEO inside the vocal booth in the control room. And they had to like this, no, no. This. So we ignored it and just took on <laughs> Sam was saying no, but Eric Griffin was like, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Sam was like, keep going, keep going. But Sam thought we fucked up the song. So Eric Griffin said, no, I'm leaving that shit just like that. And, and that was one of the main parts of B-Girls Everybody Liked it was the end. That bars on them. Just, just acting stupid, you know, is, is what people liked about that song. Yeah. I love it. A lot of people hear it and they would think by the way we tanned it out with that Cadillac bro, Cadillac bro, Cadillac bro, Cadillac bro, Cadillac bro, Cadillac bro, Cadillac. None of that was rehearsed. It's freestyle. We didn't rehearse any of that. We didn't plan it. We didn't like, oh, nothing. This shit was just off the dome, freestyle. I'm going to come in on you. You come in because we was in the booth at the same time. Like our most artists go in one at a time right now and record their vocals. We didn't do that then. We was both in there at the same time. So it was either I come in, he'll come in, I come in, you know what I'm saying? And all that shit was freestyle, you know what I'm saying? But that was just us, just doing us. It's just magic. Yeah. Is it because you were so excited to be in the studio and y'all were just having so much fun? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I think that's what it was. Their drilling in itself had just took over. Exactly, yeah. Now, since I have both of you on, I can ask both of you at the same time. Can I play B-Girls on this episode? Of course. Yes, sir. Would you guys like to introduce it like your radio DJs? Okay. Both of you do it. Do it one at a time. <laughs> well, we're on the Fascination Podcast, and we're introducing one of our hit songs, B-Girls. Yo, what's up? I'm P.O.D. And I'm Mr. Charlie. And we are the Young and Restless. Yes, sir. And we're on Fascination Podcast, bringing our smash shit to you once again, my friend. B-Girls. B-girls. Now me 
and Chris was at the beach with a couple of friends. I popped my Nova by a Bronco and a baby blue Benz. And passed some bottles of red. So I said, Red, look here. Already drunk from an overdose. A mole of bill. She turned around and had a nice figure. She said, Can't you see me walking with my nigga? Hey, so he's a punk. She said, I know he's a punk though. But you in a Nova and he's in a Bronco. She came in my face. She kept yakety yakking. That's when I popped the trunk and put the clip in the Mac 10. I'm tired of your beat, girl. Just that's your name. And if you don't know what B means, let us explain. B stands for Broncos, Big BMW, Bass, Bangles, and the Bell Mars. We see us pulling up down the avenue we'll act like we are stars. We're not trying to make a joke, we're just trying to make it known that people of the world never call B girls like bars on the kind of like Brown. Bars on the kind of like Brown. Bars on the kind of like love it i'm so excited that i get to play that song i love that song so much so thank you guys what are you guys doing now i know that mr charlie is producing what are you doing pod i'm actually writing and producing our own two record labels and surprisingly to everyone as they're going to find out eventually we have another project we're doing another young arrest project oh <gasps> We have the lead single already finished. We're just doing the mixing and mastering of it. It's called Country Boys. I, me, myself, personally feel like it's another B-Girls all over again. Like, this shit is just gonna, overnight. It's going to be gone. When is this coming out? I don't even want to say, but any day now, real soon. Really? Yeah. Whoa. Where can people go to check it out? It'll be on all the um, iTunes, Spotify. It'll be everywhere, all the platforms. Every single platform. Nice. And what's it called again? Country Boys. Country Boys by Young and Restless. Yes, sir. Yep. What made you guys decide to get together and put out another single? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just say during the years, all the Poison Ivy, the B-Girls, whether we on social media in the streets, it always comes up. Just a few years ago, somebody said, I forgot how they um, captioned it. Oh, they said, this is how old I am. And they had the video B-Girls. And the song got so like almost up to a million views and people's constantly sharing the Poison Ivy and all our songs on and also the song Pina Coladas. So we just felt like, you know, people still want to hear that fun music, you know, just with the climate right now, what's going on. I just feel like it's needed to give people back some fun, good music again. So the lyrics in this song, Country Boys, it's uh, I, I can't believe I even have to say this. It's not political like everything else right now. It's just fun. Oh, no. Oh, no. Fun. Just back to the fun. Just want to have fun. This year, just fun. That's it. Oh, you guys are badass. <laughs> hey, Streetwalkers. Here's a word from our sponsors. Now available wherever you buy audiobooks. Richard Stanley's Up On Game. From robbing banks to ruling his prison gang. Paco got spun out on meth one week and hit the yard with a box cutter in hand. He'd apparently been holding a grudge against some new guy. He was from the same car as Paco, but he seemed to prefer to stick to himself. The quiet new guy was in his late 50s and sported dark brown hair and a handlebar mustache. For whatever reason, Paco decided to allegedly target this obscure and solitary member of his car. They say the man lay there on his bunk, reading a book, when Paco came into the building. He made his way toward the man's bunk in meth-fueled haste. With his box cutter gripped in his right hand and meth making most of his decisions, at that point, Paco lunged into the man's bunk and began slicing away. And slicing and slicing. Defensive wounds were dug into his forearms and foot-long gashes were added to the quiet man's rib cage before Paco jumped off. Paco had sliced himself on his own left forearm during all the mayhem of his surprise visit with Mr. Obscure. Paco proceeded to haul ass out of there and headed back to his building. Delve into the true life story of Richard Stanley. Up on game, from robbing banks to stacking Bitcoin. And the sequel, Up on Game, When I Ruled the World. 
Now available wherever you get audiobooks. Let's get back into it. You guys going to tour or what? Y'all going to tour this song? Yeah, we got plans on all this stuff. Yeah, I, everything is planned. Once yeah, once we finish up the single, we're definitely going to hit the road. There's going to be a lot of social media presence. There's going to be a lot of street presence. Um, we, we're going to go at it again. There's so many ways now you can promote. So we're going to miss the old with the new and just make a bomb. You know? Wow. Why did you guys select the name Young and Restless? I'm going to tell you why. Because Sam wanted to call us fast forward, and I just was not going for no shit like that. That was not going to be our name. So I went home one day, and it came on TV. My cousin was watching it, The Young and the Restless. And I was sitting there looking at that wine art. For some reason, the way they painted it, it just looked it, and I was like, I'm going to take that. And so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I said, I'm going to take that. And so I went back to Sam and I was like, I got a name for it. He's like, what's up? And I said, Young and Restless. I took the the out. Because for copyright infringements. So we took the the young and the restless. We took that out and just put young and restless. And we put a little A, the little crazy looking little and sign. So we don't have the word or nothing like that. So it, it really helped a whole lot of legal things like that. But the name was befitting, like, because we were both young and we were both restless. Like it, it fit us perfectly. Did anybody ever ask you which was which? Which one of you is young? They actually do <laughs> all the time. And the crazy, and I don't, listen, for real, like, I don't know if it's the universe doing this shit, but it's like, every time we take pictures, he's always up under the word young, and I'm always up under the word risk. <laughs> like, every, I don't, like, that shit, I don't, I don't we, we don't plan that. That shit has never been planned once. And everything that we have done with our names on it, young and restless, his ass always end up under young, and I always end up under restless. That, that shit is crazy. <laughs> Love it. Now, I know that you said that there was a little bit of turmoil because, well, you had some assholes working for you who was taking all your money. Are those people still alive? No, Sam actually uh, passed. Is he the one who was taking your money? Yeah, well, this this what happened. Somebody pulled us, and this in the midst of B-Girls, Hot, Poison Ivy Hot, somebody pulled us to the side and said, you know y'all supposed to be getting 80%. And your management supposed to be getting 20% because we was getting 20% and they was taking 80%. So we aren't aware about the business. We thought that was normal. Because your kids. Yeah, you know, so we like, what? You know what I'm saying? Now forget we're idiots and we're, <laughs> we're, we're gangster kids at this time. So it, that turned the whole table for us. And that was the beginning of the lawsuits because... That's when I was saying the frightening part because we knew now we was battling up against another street dude that was older already in the streets, even though we was in the streets too, but we knew it was going to be a problem. So yeah, that was, that was the issue with that. But we end up, you know, squashing everything in the end and, and I still love him to death. You know, we forgave him, you know, and we, we was able to get past that. And, um, but it's the thing with him, he was going to prison with a federal prison. So in his mind, he, you know, he wanted most of the money that I guess to supply for his family. But shit, we had family, too. You know, we had to, <laughs> we need our money. man. So did you guys ever get paid? Yeah. Uh, well, we got paid. We had a settlement because, you know, we started. Also, oh, good. And um, we settled out of court and we got some money and they got some money. And uh, we continued to do shows. But it was still turmoil because his wife had started a fake Young Arrestors group. Jesus Christ. And they was out touring and doing shows when we was actually out. We was actually going through Orlando one day and just happened to have on the radio. And we hear, tonight, Young and Restless, I have a concert. We like, what? <laughs> so we stopped in Orlando, found out who the promoter was, found it, and took that. We couldn't get the advance. But we was able to pick up the deposit for that show. And um, the promoter called them and told them not to come up there. They'll go to jail. And, you know, so it was two young and rest of this group. Time. He actually went to the hotel, kicked them out of the hotel room. <laughs> the police escorted <laughs> them out of Orlando. <laughs> wow. Yeah. She, she hated us. Because <laughs> I had fired her, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is the thing. Let me tell you what. I'm gonna tell you why he fired. Her. This going this that. You know. Now at this time, you know, this years later, we're we're 18, 19, and we're enjoying the women. 
<laughs> that we you know what I'm saying? so she told us that we can't have no more women in our hotel rooms. Now you know once you try to control somebody wood, you gotta go. So he walked in. <laughs> Hold on, wait, 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 wait. I'm gonna tell you really, I wanna tell you the extreme of it. This woman had the audacity. We had just did a concert, told this shit down. So we got like 17 cars of women following our van. This woman pulled the van over on the expressway, got out and told all of them, stop following us or they was going to jail. If they pull up inside the hotel, I said, oh, hell no, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> when, we get, when we get back to Miami, it's going down. <laughs> wow. So that, that was like crazy, man. You know, but that's, you know, and like I said, we was able to, to get past all of that and squash it. Everybody is still like a family now, you know. Yeah. Her, her, her kids and all us, we close and everything. You know, God bless the dead too. One of one of her kids got an accident and died. Oh, wow. Well, where's this movie? She said, where's this movie? <laughs> yeah, we got to do one. We're talking about that. Actually, we're getting ready to work on documentaries and movies too as we speak. Oh, kick ass. Ah, oh, man. Well, you guys are going to have to come back on when, when those things are ready so we can help promote those. Definitely. Exactly. I know that we're kind of up against it because you guys got some things here in about 15 minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and wind this down. Mr. Charlie, where can people find you on social media? Most of it is at Mr. Charlie 305 or Mr. Charlie 1000 Instagram. And most of them is Mr. Charlie 305 from Snapchats to Twitters. They can find me. Or they can put in Charles Trahan, <laughs> you know, my actual name, Google, who the members of Young Arrestors, we we under our actual government names on Instagram. On Facebook. Yeah, well, I am. I am. On well, Facebook, <laughs> yeah. I'm under my government name. Why do you say government name? Why do you say that? That means the name that the government gave us. <laughs> <laughs> Your mom gave you that name. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But she, she got it from the government. <laughs> Yeah, but like P.O.D., <laughs> that's our pseudonym. Younger wrestlers is a pseudonym, you know what I'm saying? But our government names, the ones on our driver's licenses and social security cards, yeah, that's the ones that we use for Facebook. So all you got to do is really go, go Google our names and everything will come up. Our discographies, all the music we put out, our social media sites, you know what I'm saying? Everything will come up pretty much from that. Yeah. And uh, P.O.D., where, where are you on social media? What's your names? Uh, my name is Lenaris Johnson on Facebook. Flam Living Legend on Instagram, F L A M Flam Living Legend on Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, all the same. Are you guys on TikTok? I'm I'm just getting into TikTok. I have TikTok, but I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you, that shit be too much for me to be dealing with, man. I, I go in there and I see some stuff that I'm trying to like do that shit. Now, nah, yeah, man, for that shit, I just want to write my music and put it out. It be some funny stuff on it, but I really just just too much going on, right? But we, we got to get into it because it, it's the new wave, you know, so I'm into it. Yeah, like, listen, I, I know we have to do it, but the only thing was, was, I didn't know there were 90, like, social media sites. It's a lot. I didn't know it was 90 of them. That's so crazy. Like, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, it's 90 of them shits, bro. Ah, that's too much. <laughs> I'm not going to try to keep up with all of them. Yeah. Like I said, you can't keep up with all of those things. I don't do Twitter. Uh, I got a Twitter account, but I don't do it. I, and I, maybe I get somebody to work it later. Right. But I'm just into Instagram and Facebook right now. Snapchat. Uh, yeah, I think for TikTok, you just need to find some young person to do TikTok for you because we're too old for that shit. I don't know yeah, what yeah. the fuck I'm doing on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All I do is post clips of the show. That's it. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing on TikTok. Okay, so... Everybody listening, young and restless, they're back together, never really apart, but they got new shit coming out. The new song, Country Boys. Pay attention to all the social medias because these fools are about to go on tour. Oh, man, they got all kinds of stuff in the works. They got more music coming. They got documentaries coming. Holy moly, I'm excited. Yes, sir. Before I let you guys go, was there anything we didn't talk about or I didn't ask you about that you wanted to talk about today? Did I miss anything? Uh, for the most part, no, not really. Also, but I would say this, I done been in uh, my latest thing, I done been in a couple of movie soundtracks. The latest one was uh, the, the movie 21 and Over. I have a song in that. So we're getting ready to crank up the movies now. So you'll be hearing a lot of from us as far as acting and soundtracks too. We're going to take it to another level because the movies and music work together anyway in that collaboration. So get ready for some a lot of good, funny movies too. Yeah. And I have a book coming out. It's called Get to Know Me. What the f- 
the okay. true life story of a Miami rap legend. That book will be out. It's going to be on uh, published by Author House Publishing. It will be an ebook. I'm gonna do a, a book campaign tour with that right now too. So we got a lot of things we're working on. It's actually my autobiography. So it's a tell all, and I told it all, <laughs> you know. So, but it's it's gonna, it's gonna be a great read, and actually it's gonna be a great movie. Me and Charles been discussing doing a lot of things because we have all the components to do everything we need to do is just us coming together and actually putting our minds together and getting it done. That's really all it is, just get her done. Do you guys live close together? Uh, I actually moved uh, two hours outside of Miami. Gotcha. But, I mean, two hours, you know, like, I even wake up and I'll be there for breakfast. There you go. <laughs> all right, rock on. P.O.D. and Mr. Charlie from Young and Restless, thank you guys so much for taking the time out of your busy day and your hectic schedules to hang out and let us get to know you a little bit better on Fascination Street. I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you for having us on, man. We appreciate it. All right, no problem. We appreciate it, too. Oh, man. Thank you guys so much. All right. Thank you. Same to you. Charles, I love you, Charles. Love you, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2001 album Intransigence, used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is from the song Say My Name, off the 2021 album Underdog Anthems, used with permission from Jax Hollow. If you like the show, tell a friend. Subscribe and rate and review the show on iTunes and wherever else you download podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. All the episodes are available there as well. Check me out on Vero at Fascination Street Pod and TikTok at Fascination Street Pod. And again, thanks for listening.